What I want to do today, um, in 25 minutes, is tell you about 129 weeks of my life. <laughs> Firstly, um, why did I choose my title? It's because um, in the satire of the Three Estates uh, by Lindsay, first performed in the 16th century, there is a mention um, of Tully Lum, which was the name um, of the Carmelite Friary in Perth. Um, we have one of the characters um, saying that he was walking along the road between St. Johnston and Canoe, um, and he found a cowl of a white friar on the street. Um, <coughs> I find it interesting that Lindsay is referring to the Carmelites because, I mean, they're fairly absent um, from most of our documentary evidence um, of Perth. Now, Perth um, had four um, monastic houses. We have the Blackfriars, founded in 1231 um, at B on the aerial photograph. We have the Greyfriars, Franciscans, founded in 1460 at G. We have the Carthusian Monastery, <laughs> uh, the only one in Scotland, founded in 1429 at C. And right the way out at W is Tully Lum, uh, the Carmelites, almost a mile away um, from the medieval town. But, interestingly enough, right beside the major medieval western routeway into Perth. Now, my relationship with this site, um, it's become a bit like one of my children, to be honest. Um, the first time I was there was 1982, um, when I ran a manpower services scheme in advance of a development by the Scottish Development Agency. Um, Back in the days, as you can see, before the wonders of health and safety, no high vis, no hard hats, no fence. Uh, people could wander around um, and really surround you when you were doing site tours. Um, a visit from the current, um, back then, prior provincial of the Carmelites, um, who happily stood on the corner of the church for me uh, in full regalia. Um, and one of the most interesting finds back in 82 is this, which is the original um, seal matrix of the friary, which says, S. Prioris Fartrum Carmel de Pert, the seal of the prior and brothers of the Carmelites of Perth. Um, published in the Society of Antiquaries Monograph in 1987. Um, but... I knew where the rest of the friary was, because in 82, we basically got the east end of the church, the eastern side of the east range, uh, and very little else out on that side of the complex. I knew the rest of it was in here. So when in 2007, somebody put in a planning application to redevelop um, this site, um, which at that time was occupied by Normans the Joiners, um, an application went in to build retail units. Um, that's what that grey black L shape indicates. That's the footprint um, of the proposal in 2008. So SUAT, um, which still existed back then, um, was commissioned to do some site evaluation, followed by a major excavation of the footprint of the building. Um, the plan being that the site would be dug in two halves. We would start on the church and dump our spoil down here. When the church was finished, we would move the spoil up there and look at this bit. Uh, but that's all well and good. Um, we were there for eight weeks, um, concentrating on the church and finding 102 burials. Um, I got a phone call one Friday afternoon from the developer um, telling me to stop. Um, I think he began to work out how much money it was going to cost him. Um, so we were closed down, um, largely due to uh, the credit crunch. Um, the site was covered with geotextile, spoil heap was dumped back in it, it was backfilled, uh, and it went to sleep for six years until I got a phone call um, from the developer who said to me that he thought it was time to start back on the site. Um, we'd already found 102 burials. There couldn't be that many more to find, surely. Um, it wasn't going to take very long. Um, 
could we have a meeting? Um, we had a meeting. He said, um, okay, you can start back on site, but I'd quite like it just to be you, please. Um, because, you know, you can just chip away at it in the background. Uh, we'll be done in eight weeks, uh, and then we can proceed with the development. So, July 2014, um, I got the machines back in, removed the spoil to uh, expose the geotextile, grabbed my son Fergus, uh, and said, okay, you can give me a hand, you're on your holidays. Um, and I think that's put him off archaeology for life. Um, he's now studying engineering at Strathclyde, a uh, sensible man. I did say to him, look, you know, I don't spend all my time shoveling soil off geotextile, honest governor. Um, it does get interesting, um, but we never actually got to that stage uh, until he had to go back to university. Anyway, so that's me back on site, July 2014. Now, the easiest way for me to deal with this um, is to be very selective about what I'm going to show you, because there's an awful lot going on on this site, um, and I'm very much at an early phases um, of my interpretation. But, here we go. Right, 102 burials in 2008, uh, another 204 um, by the time I'd finished on site in July of last year. That gives us a total of 306. These are all from the church. That's an important point to make. I have not yet found the graveyard on this site. Dot, 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 dot. Um, what complicates things at Tully Lum is that you have the Carmelite church, which is built in 1262, which I've indicated in green on there. Um, that occupies a very standard layout with the cloister and ranges coming off to the south. But... The involvement of the Bishop of Dunkeld is what complicates things here, because for a period, he moves down to Perth, and this becomes his headquarters. The first thing he does is to rebuild the nave of the church from the foundations up. And we have good documentary evidence for this in the Dunkeld rental book. Curiously, rather than using the existing foundations of the church, he builds his new nave just slightly adjacent to the existing building. Why that should be, I haven't quite decided yet, but I think it might have a lot to do with the state of that church when he arrives. I don't think it was in a very good condition at all. Anyway, of these 306 burials, what is distinctive about them is there's a, quite a mixture of different burial practices. For example, the earliest phase of burial that I've identified so far, all of these burials are buried with bits of wood this is green wood with the bark still on it that's been cut and laid on the body at the time of burial. These look like staffs, but they're not thick enough to function as staffs, so I think they're symbolic. That's quite interesting. Also, there are at least two examples of burials where missing bits of the body, like arm bones for example, have been replaced with bits of wood. These are not, these don't look like artificial limbs, they're just bits of wood. So from a distance you could say, oh yeah, all of that body's there, and you look and think, well, hang on a minute, no, it's not. Um, so this one, that is actually wood there, uh, that's not a genuine arm bone. Um, and there's another one you can just slightly make out just below the scale. So, curious um, limb replacement going on. Um, also, there is a skull with an eye patch uh, that's still in place. Um, get all the pirate jokes out now, please. Um, two of the burials in the church are buried with shoes on. Now, when I say shoes, this one here, which is in the chancel, um, actually has shoe soles on its feet. These are from different shoes, so each sole is from a different shoe. Um, there are no uppers, there are just straps. I think these are supposed to look like sandals. Um, and the position of the hands of that burial are like this. So I think that's quite significant as well. Um, the other burial here also has shoes, but these are more like boots. Um, and this time they, they are a genuine pair. So that's curious as well. Um, even more curious, this burial in the chancel 
is buried with these four bizarre objects um, that nobody has been able to show me any parallels for yet. Um, I've been speaking to Roberta Gilchrist about this, and I mean, these have not been analysed as yet, but she wonders if they might be wax. Um, you often get burials with wax chalices, wax patterns. Um, could these be supposed to look like bishops' croziers, maybe? Um, but do look how small they are. Um, so, a mystery. Um, one of the burials in the church, this is a female. Um, around her neck is this jet and single glass necklace. Um, you can see there is still surviving um, past the cord um, through the beads. Um, that may be a rosary. Um, I know there's only five, six beads, um, but maybe, maybe you could use it as a rosary. What interests me is that is buried above this burial here. This burial below is buried under a complete Caithness roof slate. Um, you can maybe make out the peg hole there. There is a documentary reference to the Carmelite church being re-roofed in 1517 with 36,000 Caithness roof slates. So maybe we can argue that if that relates to the re-roofing of the church in 1517, our burial with the jet necklace or rosary above it is of 16th century date. Um, I think that's quite interesting. Um, under the <coughs> south wall um, of the rebuilt church, we have a wood-lined grave. Um, this is not a coffin as such. They've dug the grave, they've lined it with wood, and then they've put the body in. Now, when I say they've put the body in, this is not a genuine body. This is, these are bones that have been moved from somewhere else, and somebody has laid it out to look like a body, and they've got it wrong, because <laughs> these are the top um, of the leg hip joints here. The ball sockets are facing out. Uh, I don't think that works. Um, <laughs> to help with the walking. So this has come from somewhere else when the church is being remodelled. I think it's come from there, where there is a former mural tomb uh, in the north wall of the building. So when the nave is being rebuilt, somebody is moving bones, presumably um, of an important person. And then, also in the rebuilt church at the west end, we have a massive wood-lined grave, two and a half metres square, with three people in it. Now, what I love about this, if you look at the plan, the middle burial is a very tall adult. He's so tall that his feet are sticking out at the end of the grave, and they're not able to fit in an end of the board. Um, so they've obviously got their dimensions slightly wrong. Um, so we have a tall adult in the middle, surrounded by two younger um, people on either side. These are all male, I think. The adult has an iron bracelet uh, on his wrist. This young adult here has a wooden staff. Now, that's interesting because all of the other staffs are in the very early phase of burial. This, I think, relates to the 16th century phase of the church and is the latest example um, of a staff um, that was found. And needless to say, I can't find any parallels for a woodline grave this size so far. Uh, and that has to be a single event. So, interesting. And it's at a very odd end of the church, I have to say. Um, also, once the burials are taken out, the wooden lining for this grave um, is reused timber. If you look at this one at the bottom, um, you can see the bolts and nail holes in it. I wonder if this could even be wooden panelling from the earlier version of the church that they're reusing as lining um, for this grave. And that's where that grave is located within the rebuilt bishop's uh, church, the red, as indicated on there. So, 306 burials in the church. Um, now, you have to realise that that represents a period of burial of about 300 years. So although it sounds like a lot of burials, it actually isn't that many. 
Um, it's only about one a year from 1262 uh, until the Reformation. Now, when we get to the actual complex itself, right in the earliest phase, I am getting evidence for some sort of semi-industrial activity. But there is an awful lot of burning, charcoal, uh, there's no industrial waste coming out of this whatsoever. I think what I'm looking at here are welfare facilities for the guys building the church, the, the first phase of the Carmelite church, 1262. Um, as well as having this big spread of charcoal and the remains of about two or three clay-lined ovens, there are these small hearths, um, which I think you can imagine as being little cooking fires, uh, where people are cooking their lunch, um, depending on how long they were, maybe their evening meals. Um, so that is happening to the west of the Carmelite church. When we look at the Carmelite church proper, straight away, <coughs> There are some very odd things going on. Um, the Carmelite Church, the 1262 build, which is the very straight um, ashlar mortar bonded blocks, is built on top of what looks like a buttress um, and a much wider stone foundation that includes one incised cross um, and is at slightly at odds with the alignment of the wall that has been built on top of it. Could it be that I've got evidence here for a church that's already on the site that is being given to the Carmelites when they arrive in 1262? Um, there is certainly documentary evidence that suggests that might be a possibility. So once the church itself has been built, um, we begin to get metal surfaces appearing. There seems to be a path that is leading into the Carmelite complex from the west. Um, that's the church that you can see top right there. Um, there is a courtyard. In the middle of the courtyard is this post socket. Um, I guess you could argue that might have held a cross, um, although again, that is a rather odd end of the building. Um, so, curious things going on in our, our earliest phase. Um, so, Carmelite church, um, fairly simple rectangular building um, with a wall coming out of its western end which is forming uh, one side of that metal pathway that is coming in. On its southwestern side we have a west range. Um, normally this would have been a very tall building, maybe two or three stories, um, but what I'm looking at is very much the ground level. It's been very extensively robbed there are no wall lines surviving at all, just very deep robber trenches. Uh, thanks to Jonathan Wordsworth, who dug that very deep Jonathan, uh, that very deep robber trench uh, in an afternoon. Uh, it's always good to have a human JCB with you. Um, inside the building, mortar and green sandstone floors, and very damaged remains of what originally I thought might be an anvil base. But now I think it's actually something to do with uh, internal water distribution uh, inside that building. Um, very limited evidence for what the rest of the building looked like, apart from one fragment um, from what Richard Fawcett tells me um, is a window uh, like this one here. So we are getting a feel for what uh, certainly the ground floor uh, of the West Range would look like. The South Range. Um, that's the West Range coming down there. It stops. There's a path coming into the complex there. And here we have the beginnings of what is the western end of the South Range. Um, in the floor um, of that range, we have three drains. One of the drains here is feeding up and taking water or waste um, from the water supply that I'll speak about in a minute. The other two drains are stopping dead at wall faces. And I think they're taking waste from above, from the floors above in this building, and taking it out through uh, the western wall of the building there. Um, in the southern wall of the South Range, there's evidence that there's been a doorway here at some stage that is leading out onto a courtyard area which is absolutely packed with oyster shells. 
The interesting thing about this is it was like a big ark. And I could imagine somebody coming out of that door with a bucket <coughs> and just chucking stuff out onto the courtyard. So not very tidy, um, but at least it's a way of getting rid of your waste shell, I guess. Um, also in that courtyard, quite a deep rubbish pit um, that had the remains of Penanial brooch missing its pin um, in the fill. And beside it, this rather curious stone-lined pit. Um, it's not very big, um, but is that maybe for holding food storage? Do you keep your shells in something like that before you eat them? But again, it's, it's not very big. Um, difficult to find parallels for that as well. Uh, that's a common phrase in this lecture, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, then, the southern doorway in that wall is blocked. And they take down the doorway, and rather take, than taking away the stone and reusing it somewhere else, they dig a pit right against the wall and bury the arch in the pit, and bury the lintel from that doorway inside the building. Um, very lazy, um, and I can't quite understand why you wouldn't use stuff like reuse stuff like that, although it is sculpted material and it's difficult often to reuse that. But it shows some sort of remodelling is going on with that range, which may well relate to the Bishop of Dunkeld again. Um, and we then, I then picked up the continuation of that south range right up until the limit of my excavations, which is the chain dot line there. Um, it will carry on right across the site um, in an area that is originally eventually going to be a car park, so is unlikely to be damaged. Inside that extension of the south range, I have evidence for internal division of the building, um, a doorway out of the building to the north, and in occupation deposits on the floor, a complete penanio brooch, this time with a pin, um, which is rather nice. Now, in the remodelling of this complex, they add a water supply. What, they, what is happening is there is a clay-lined ditch coming into the site from the northwest, um, which is coming in through the original western wall of the Carmelite Church, so it can't be anything to do with that phase. And I think I've got very tentative evidence for there being a lead pipe, um, at least in one part of this ditch, which has been taken out uh, and reused somewhere else. And from the ceramics associated with it, certainly um, of a 16th century date, um, which would match the, the Bishop of Dunkeld's remodelling. That water supply then continues um, along the eastern face of the West Range, where it's a stone-lined uh, drain running up here. Um, it then enters the West Range, where it becomes a timber uh, tree trunk that has been cut in half and shaped to give a U profile. So you have to imagine this as almost like being a trough in the floor, I think. So, uh, and I managed to lift that trunk in its entirety. Uh, so it's lurking somewhere waiting for C14, Dendro, who knows. Um, and interestingly, under the South Range, I got some really good evidence for the way that this site has been levelled and built up before they build the complex on top of it. There are layers of clay and layers of stone that have been laid. Um, potential foundation uh, scaffold post holes um, for the building. So um, good for some attempt at reconstructing the sequence of build. So just to show you, they're taking their water from um, a spring up on Wells Hill, which is at the top of this slope here beside the site, there is quite a marked rise in the ground, so that's quite good for taking water down the slope and then down through the site, which is on a slight incline anyway. So it comes into the site there, runs down the West Range, runs into the West Range, and those drains, or at least one of them, in the other end of the, the South Range are connected into that water supply. So presumably there's going to be some sort of sluice system to control the water although I didn't get any evidence for that. And I got the very end um, at the junction with the water supply of what I think is the main drain, which will be running, I assume, 
down to where the toilet block for the friary is, which is outside the area of the development. But, interestingly enough, right underneath where my site toilet was. <laughs> <laughs> now, quickly, um, as well as getting good evidence for different burial practices, what's going on in the different ranges, the courtyards outside, despite the amount of burial inside the two phases of this church, I got quite good evidence for some of the uh, internal features. This, I think, is the chancel arch foundations uh, in the first phase of the Carmelite church, which maybe would have looked something like that. Uh, evidence for the foundations um, of a column. Um, another screen division inside the building um, containing a fragment of a leg from a tomb effigy. Uh, so that's something that's been knocked about um, in the redevelopment of the church. Um, Evidence for internal floor surfaces, consistently they're white mortar. The white mortar is being, the graves are dug through it, and then they're lying the white mortar over the filled in grave again, and that's a continuous process. Um, I'm amazed that any floors survived at all. Um, three floor tiles from the site, um, so very little in the way of evidence for ceramic flooring. When it comes to the demolition, I find this really interesting. The demolition of the two ranges looks like, very much like it's a medieval um, activity. I've got late medieval ceramics coming out um, associated with this robbing. They're leaving steps in to help them get the stone um, away from sight. There's the bottom of a wine glass, rather like this one, that I've been told is also 16th century. Um, let's party like it's 1559. <laughs> um, and that's a summary um, of what I think I've got as regards the phasing. Yeah, I've virtually dug the entire complex, uh, but I know where the rest of it is. Um, we'll wait and see what happens. Um, and now I'm at a stage where I'm pulling together all of the post-excavation costs to try and get my client to agree to them all. Um, I wish I'd become an accountant. Um, these are the things that I want to try and do. Reconstruct the complex. If there's a graveyard, where is it? Was there a separate bishop's lodging, or was he remodelling the friary? Is there an earlier church? The ranges are destroyed at the 1559 Reformation, I think. What about the church? I would like to try and raise some money for some good DNA analysis of these skeletons and see if I can plug in some living Perth residents as well. I think that would be really interesting. And aiming, hopefully, for publication in SARE um, by 2020. Thank you. And thanks for the